Good afternoon, good morning, good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nachi Majwe from ET Africa. Welcome to the fifth Local Climate Solutions for Africa Virtual Congress, LOCS, which is held by ET Africa in partnership with the government of Rwanda and the city of Kigali. This is the how can digital, well, this is the harnessing digital innovation session um, that you are tuned into. And the main question in this session that we'd like to answer is how can digital innovations harness access to climate finance? And before we start the session, I would like to just quickly run you through some um, information in terms of how to go about using the platform. So as you can see, um, on your screen that this session does have live interpretation. So we invite you to listen in your language of your choice. Um, and those are in, um, English or French. And in order to be able to change the language, please look at the Zoom control bar at the bottom of your screen and then click on the interpretation icon um, to choose your language of choice. There's also the option of the um, to mute the original audio. And this is just to ensure that the language of of your choice is more audible. As an overview, um, we've got a, a big panel of expert speakers that will be speaking across many different topics um, related to, to the main session topic, which is digital innovation. And we will have a dedicated question and answer session. So please feel free to make use of the Q&A box, um, which is in, in, in the chat at the bottom of your screen so that the speakers can then respond to those questions during the dedicated time. And then just one last thing about using the platform. If you're not able to, um, to get support from the help desk through the Congress platform, please send an email to um, the email address provided on the screen or go to or, or click on support at the top of your screen. Please note that the session is being recorded, so you will be able to listen to it again at a later stage or share it with other people that may not have been able to, to attend. And we'd really like to encourage um, participation during the session. So I've already mentioned that there is a Q&A, so um, please feel free to send your, your questions. And then at a later stage, we'll then um, be ensuring that those are responded to. I'll now just quickly move on to an introduction about ITI, um, Local Governments for Sustainability, for those that are not familiar with it. Um, ITI is a global network of more than 1,750 local and regional governments that are committed to sustainable urban development. So we are active in over 100 countries and we work to influence sustainability policy to drive local action for um, low emission, nature-based, equitable, resilient, and secular development. And these are what we call our five pathways, which I'll also talk about um, in my next slide. And we have a big team of experts um, across our 23 offices around the world. So um, this event, as mentioned, is being held by ETHI Africa. We're based in, in Cape Town in South Africa, but we work across the whole continent. So moving on to the next slide, these are the five ITLI pathways that I was talking about. So this is really what grounds ITLI's work. And these um, five pathways are designed to create systemic change and in order to have a framework for integrated solutions so that things are not done um, in silos. And really with the aim of ensuring that there's a balance um, in the patterns of human life, the built environment, as well as the natural environment. And then um, related to this session in particular, which is really is a big topic, particularly in, in African cities. Um, the objective is really for us to be able to discuss um, the role of ICT in socioeconomic development on the continent and explore what the opportunities are that can then enhance the, um, the lives and the national um, as well as city level economies through amongst others, the fourth industrial revolution. And with the, with the range of experts that we have, they'll also be looking at how we can then address climate change and placing it at the center of, of the discussions. And also very important in line with the theme of the Congress is looking at access to climate finance or financing um, the, the, the future that we, we really want. So um, it's going to be 
a session where we'll be discussing challenges, but more than anything, looking at what are the options for, for solutions and how digital innovation can be used to improve um, the lives of people living in African cities. So um, for the last slide, um, I would also like to mention that as part of Italy's work, we as, the, as Italy Africa based in Cape Town as mentioned, we are also home to um, the Global Cities Biodiversity Center. And we offer cities a broad um, portfolio of support services um, through our, our very big team, which I, I, I spoke about already. So we also have um, this global mandate of trying to find solutions to, to complex issues surrounding um, natural capital degradation of ecosystem services, amongst other things. So um, with that said, that's an introduction to, to Italy Africa. I would now like to um, introduce the moderator for the session, um, Dr. Dr. Diren Somoni from Wirtz University, and he's a senior le lecturer for innovation policy and management, and he will be moderating the session. Thank you very much, and we hope for active participation and enjoy the session. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Somoni. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, my name is Duran Sumoni. Uh, thanks to Ms. Majore for the kind introduction. Um, so I will be your moderator today, and I will be primarily a timekeeper, but I will also try and um, try and point out the highlights of what our distinguished speakers will be talking about. We have eight speakers in all, and we will be having uh, four uh, who will present their thoughts to us. I will have a short question and answer, and then we'll have another four. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Surendra Colin Thakur uh, from the Durban University of Technology. Um, Please go ahead. Good day, Africa. My name is Colin Thakur. I'm from the Durban University of Technology, where I am the research chair in digitalization. I consider myself a, a digital activist, and um, I'm really interested in the impact of policy and, and, its imp and its possibility of change within the continent. So let's talk about policy. Policy derives from experience, it derives from discourse and debate. Consider each sovereign country which has its own unique geographic border. We understand this, we get this. We share the sun, we share the rain, and yes, we also share the carbon emissions. We also share the internet as a global orderless village. However, we need to ensure that digital corporates don't switch geographic mode simply to avoid tax. How much tax do tech giants pay? At the, at the top level, we, as a continent, need an urgent policy to prevent the abuse of our cyberspace and the export of currency. Companies must register and pay taxes in every con country that they operate in. We lost our art, we lost our mineral wealth. Let's at least preserve our cyberspace and the wealth that it generates. The traditional policy crafting process is grounded on caution and consultation. This slows policy de development through what we call analysis paralysis. Democ democracy must and should be balanced with opportunity. Policy morphs into non-regulation, self-regulation, minimal regulation, and over-regulation. Mm -hmm. Yet we still have a paper-based framework trying to regulate this exponential change, which we now call the fourth industrial revolution. However, even conducive, productive, proactive policy does not necessarily translate into adoption or action. Measure carbon-friendly incentives against its low uptake. Which policy can we leverage to encourage uptake? France demanded that all unsold yet edible food be donated to food banks through a punitive fine. It further incentivizes through tax breaks. It also provided a functional logistical support system to enable this. This reduced methane emission and provided and proved to be a blessing during the COVID pandemic. What circular economy bonus penalty policies can we introduce with respect to climate? Consider PPEs. We are disposing billions every single day. What are we doing with the wastage? Or can we store these, these wastes till we figure out what we can do with them? 
There seems to be no action there. South Africa is really, really good at policy, but hopeless at operationalizing such policies. In fact, one of our neighbors cut and pasted a policy from our website five years ago. We still haven't implemented that policy. This suggests we must compare and shamelessly reuse good policy wherever it proves to be useful. Plastic bags created an, an environmental and a visual pollution. South Africa increased the price of plastic bag to curb usage. This failed as customers simply absorbed the cost. Rwanda, on the other hand, carefully crafted a policy to ban plastic bags involving large-scale community sensitization. The policy was brave, initially very unpopular, and ultimately successful. South Africa similarly achieved exponential decline in smoking by banning a cigarette advertisement. The world united to get rid of CFCs. How can we as the world agree and react to climate change when COP1 all the way through to COP25 have seemingly failed? My views, we need strong political will balanced with a equally effective policy framework. More than that, we need something what we call a massive transformative purpose. A massive transformative purpose, or MTP, is a highly aspirational tagline that exponential organizations such as Google adopt. Google's MTP, for instance, is organizing all the world's information. Electric car maker tells us MTP is accelerates the transition to sustainable transportation. You see, so our, our MTP must, 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 must be directed and co-directed. We need focused individuals throughout the ecosystem to drive the MTP, like Bill Gates and like a Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was a dreamer who had a knack of understanding the next technology, but he also knew that he had little technical skills. So crucially, he knew what he did not know. The skills that are needed to drive MTP is the skill, firstly, to let well enough alone, to lead without interfering, the gift and the wisdom to evangelize, and yet to disrupt boldly and shamelessly, and the courage to remove blockages. This is what we need. Let's talk about fintechs. Fintechs are, no, are wondrous. They are nimble, but they are also naive. So how does one encourage and enable creativity while maintaining financial policy and controls in the fintech environment. This is where the notion of the something called the regulatory sandbox is so clever and is so amazing. It allows testing what is scenarios in a protective environment and in the context of a regulatory framework. The South African Reserve Bank, for instance, is working with fintech to create such an, uh, an enabling environment. Time Bank is the first beneficiary of it. Time Bank is now the fastest growing digital bank in the world, reaching 1.2 million new customers within one year. It registers a customer within three to five minutes. For so three to five minutes in Africa, without even seeing the, the customer. So as two sides of the coin, policymakers and innovators must work together. It is imperative that they build each other's skills. As they teach each other, they must learn from each other. And this is a kind of collaborative process that we need. We need bold environmental and political policies like the banning of plastics, like the banning of cigarette advertisements, and mediating policies such as the repurposing of edible unsold food. This must be matched with imaginative and innovative environments like the sandbox that I speak about. Is the light at the end of the fiber? Yes, there is. The cynic may well ask whose fiber is it? Let's ensure that the fiber is, in, is installed by Africans. Nothing should ever be done for us without us ever again. Thank you. All right. Excellent, uh, Dr. Tucker, right on time. Now we'll move to our next speaker, who is uh, Mr. Angelos Munezero. Mr. Munezero, please go for it. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Liran. Hope you are able to hear me very well. Thank you. As you mentioned, I'm Angelos Munezero from uh, the Ministry of ICT and Innovation in Rwanda, and here we'll be uh, presenting uh, our agenda towards uh, having a smart city as a flagship that uh, we are leading um, under the umbrella of uh, the Smart Africa Alliance. Thank you. If you can go on the next slide, please. Here we have uh, our smart city agenda, which have three underlying pillar, all focuses on three things. First one is uh, the planning and management. And the second one is the infrastructure. And the third one is people. 
this is under our smart city concept, which of course includes uh, uh, more components in regards to the climate change and also other aspects of our technology. And here we mainly be focusing only on um, the infrastructure, which entails uh, even energy, water and transportation, and to see how we can position ourselves in order to uh, make our climate better and benefit from it. You can go to the next slide, please. So into uh, the Rwanda Smart City Plan, we have three main pillars. And the first one is a smart governance and planning where we put together public engagement to make sure that uh, new policies that you are bringing are responding to uh, the challenges that the citizens are facing. And the second one is the smart and efficient uh, services and utilities where we bring new technologies, let's say in the transport sector among many others, to make sure that the new solutions that we are bringing are innovative and using uh, new resources that doesn't affect our climate. And on the third one is localized innovation for social and economic development. And here we focus more mainly on how can we finance some new uh, research and development innovations that are responding to uh, the climate need so that we we are having new solutions that are addressing some of the challenges that uh, we are facing. So here we have some initiatives that uh, we are focusing on now into Rwanda. And the first one is to have a, a smart city communities command and control center. And this one will help us to have a centralized view on all solutions that are being uh, developed to make sure they are all speaking to each other so that we smoothly advance forward. And the next one is a smart uh, waste collection. How do we ensure that in our cities we have uh, a smart uh, waste collection approach through which all the waste across the city are put together using new technology sensors and others, and we can even uh, revert this uh, waste to make new other devices or components. The third one is the air quality monitoring system. Also here we are focusing on how we can be able to monitor and to control the air quality to see, for example, there's some initiatives on how can we reduce uh, vehicles that are emitting things that affect uh, our environment. And uh, this air quality monitoring system will be helping us to control how are we affecting uh, our air and environment to see how we can bring new uh, solutions that are, are uh, addressing those challenges. And the last one is the citizen engagement portal, which is under development to make sure we are connected with the people and also make sure we are bringing uh, solutions that are addressing the right challenges that our people are facing. So on the next slide, going into the transport uh, sector, which is uh, mainly the one that um, if you look into African continent and mostly into our country, this is one that affects heavily our climate. We are looking and exploring into new ways of having uh, new technologies such as uh, fast and rapid transit, which not only uh, enhance the way people are moving in cities, but also it reduces uh, 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 the emission that affects our climate by using solar power and new technologies. There's also some others like uh, smart traffic management. How do we ensure that the traffic are well managed using AI to make sure that there is no jam into our roads? And the last one is intelligence transport systems also, which is having a view on how uh, the transport system across cities, across countries can be enhanced and be well used. Also on other priorities, we have a, a smart water management. How do we ensure that uh, we can control the management and the use of water and also to make sure water are accessible by each and everyone. The last is uh, the public infrastructure as well. How do we ensure that uh, public infrastructure are having uh, all the basics that are needed for a smart city? If we go into the next slide, please. So into the slide, it shows uh, the current status where we are on different projects as the smart water management and the others that uh, I, I have mentioned above where we, we have come from and where we are now, but this is still 
a progress that we are working on. And on here, I'm alluding to what uh, my colleagues have uh, mentioned around uh, financing for new innovative and approaches that can change and bring new solutions to uh, our climate and the environment in general. What I would say here is that we need more uh, a, a, a focus and contribution and also to onboard more partners to contribute on this aspect because when we look into our aspect, our ecosystem in Rwanda, we have new good solutions, but when it comes to having a financing mechanism uh, tailored for the specific solution is still uh, an issue. In our context, we have uh, more uh, different ways. Maybe we have more time to discuss about it to support innovations and new uh, business or new solutions that are addressing some challenges that the country is facing. But when it comes to tailored support towards uh, innovative approach or solutions for the climate change, this is still uh, a, a big issue somehow. So I think without taking much of the time. This is uh, what uh, I plan to share with you and uh, we'll be looking forward to addressing some of uh, the questions and also to getting more contribution from um, the participant. Thank you. All right, excellent, uh, Mr. Menazero, right on time. And uh, we now move on to our next speaker who is Ms. Helene Van Kynigan an analyst of the Climate Policy Initiative. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. I am uh, Helene Van Kaniem, an analyst at Climate Policy Initiative. And um, I'll be uh, answering today's panel question um, by uh, kicking off by identifying some of the barriers to climate finance um, and green infrastructure in cities, for which I will then present innovative financial instruments that help overcome them. So the barriers of climate finance for cities include restrictions on municipal budgets. Most cities depend on their national governments to fund climate smart infrastructure projects. There's also a lack of credit worthiness as the World Bank indicates that in developing countries, only 4% of the 500 largest cities are credit worthy in international capital markets. Um, the, there's project preparation needs where cities often lack the capacity to prepare infrastructure projects and um, lack of investor ready bankable projects of sufficient size and quality. It's therefore crucial to maintain a focus on sustainable, inclusive and resilient urban development, even more so due to the COVID-19 pandemic as cities have been disproportionately hard hit uh, by this crisis. So at CPI, we're working to tackle these barriers through a couple of initiatives, one of which is the City Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, or the Alliance in short. Uh, since 2019, CPI holds the Secretariat of the Alliance, which is a coalition of leaders committed to mobilizing finance for city-level climate action at scale by 2030. So it serves as the only multi-level and multi-stakeholder coalition aimed at closing the investment gap for urban and subnational climate projects and infrastructure globally. So on this slide, you can see that it counts 63 active members who represent both the supply and demand side of city level climate finance, including public and private institutions. So on the next slide, um, I'm gonna showcase another CPI program where we focus on surpassing financing barriers for climate mitigation and adaptation projects, which is the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. It is a public private initiative with the goal to unlock private investment in clean energy and climate change at scale. Um, to date, the lab identified, developed and launched 49 innovative financial instruments, mobilizing in total $2.2 billion uh, US dollars for climate action. Um, today, I'll walk you through some of our city specific instruments that propose a solution to uh, the previously mentioned barriers and are relevant for Sub Saharan Africa. Um, so, on the next slide, you can see uh, three of those instruments. The first one is the Subnational Climate Finance Initiative. Um, this is a 750 million blended finance fund focused on mid-sized infrastructure with a deal size between five to 75 million dollars. 
The fund is combined with a technical assistance facility that provides project preparation, capacity building to municipalities, and certifies all its individual projects for SDG impact prior to investment. It's the first private equity fund to combine these technical assistance features, and this way it tackles the barriers of cities' lack of capacity to develop green infrastructure projects. Um, another, um, if you can stay on that, the previous slides, um, another instrument is uh, cooling as a service, which is a, a paper service model that decreases energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions from cooling systems in cities around the world by making more efficient uh, cooling technologies more accessible to customers. So it does so by eliminating upfront investment in clean cooling technology for customers who instead pay per unit of cooling they consume, which then in turn strengthens incentives for efficient consumption. So BASE and uh, KSEP launched the initiative to scale up demand for efficient and clean cooling systems in uh, emerging economies. And then a third instrument I would like to highlight is the Brief Better Bond. This is a bond issue that has tied in technical assistance and financial incentives for local governments to finance reduction in air pollution and GHG emissions from urban infrastructure in emerging markets. So the bond itself will be issued by a city, state, or a special purpose vehicle. Um, and that will raise the financing for emission reduction infrastructure. Uh, while capacity building for cities focused on uh, identifying sources of air pollution then project pipeline preparation and strengthening enabling conditions, the initiative may also include a result-based payment mechanism that would reduce the city's effective cost of borrowing, also addressing uh, the barriers for um, access to private finance. Um, I pointed out three instruments that are innovative because they respond to market failures and are ways to address barriers of um, access to, to private finance in cities. Yet, I also want to touch upon the digital elements, so um, how technology and more particularly blockchain can be used to accelerate climate finance in adaptation projects. And I'm going to do that by highlighting the use case of a blockchain-based index insurance on the next slide. Um, this is an instrument that is currently being piloted in Kenya by, the consor by a consortium of organizations, Acre Africa, Etherisk, and Sprout Insure. Uh, so the Blockchain Climate Risk Crop Insurance is a, a digital platform wherein crop insurance policies are plugged into smart contracts on a blockchain and indexed to local weather which you can see in the middle part of the graphic. Uh, so there is an intermediary or insurance company that collects policy data when a farmer's, farmer registers for crop insurance products, which in turn is used as an input for the smart contracts on the blockchain, as well as the weather data collected. So what happens during an extreme weather event, policies are automatically triggered, uh, which facilitates fair, transparent, and timely payouts through mobile money provider. And the benefit, benefits for farmers translate into a lower premium due to reduced transaction costs during the processing of claims, as well as reduced claim cycles from three months up to uh, one week. So finally, we encourage you to be part of this journey by applying to our open call for sustainable finance ideas for the 2021 lab cycle, which closes on the 22nd of December. We accept all mitigation and adaptation finance ideas globally, but also have a specific thematic stream focused on sustainable cities and a few regional ones, including one focused on um, Southern Africa. For more information, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or my colleagues and stay tuned on the Climate Finance Lab website. So many thanks um, for listening in today and I'm looking forward to hearing more on innovation in cities from uh, the other panelists. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Van Kynigen. Right on time. Now we have Mr. Joel Wanjoy uh, from Goodwill Investments. Please proceed, Mr. Wanjoy. Thank you, Dr. Dylan. Uh, so my name is uh, Joel Wanjoy here, uh, working with uh, Goodwill Investments, which is uh, an impact investing uh, within uh, Sub-Saharan Africa trying to look at uh, innovative uh, uh, business, which are trying to address the issues of FinTech as well as a clean tech. So I'm here to look at uh, probably 
uh, what would be uh, some of uh, the most innovative ways trying to address uh, climate mitigation uh, uh, using uh, smart infrastructure as well as digital finance. Uh, I can't see the slides. I don't know whether you are sharing that or I should share from my side. Dr. Dylan. Um, please share from, from your side. Okay. Oh, should, okay. Can you share? Please? Okay, we have shared. Please go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry for that. Uh, so, so basically, I'm trying to look at uh, some of the most innovative ways uh, in uh, artificial intelligence as well as blockchain, how these can be used to unlock potential in terms of uh, financing uh, for the climate change. And I would like basically to start with a little bit of uh, definition. What, what are some of these you know, digital ways? So probably whenever we talk of uh, artificial intelligence, we are trying just to say uh, a certain program, you know, uh, which uses some sense and reasoning uh, to make some rules uh, from uh, a certain aspect of data. And of course, there are many uh, subsets of artificial intelligence, uh, some of which includes, you know, machine learning, uh, which is basically looking at uh, big data and trying to make uh, some decisions based uh, on uh, repetitive, you know, formats from that big data. We have also deep learning, we offer us uh, neural networks, and also computer vision. Uh, the other aspect is the blockchain, uh, which is uh, uh, in a simple way of defining it, is a de decentralized, you know, distributed uh, records which are stored somewhere uh, through data encryption. So both uh, blockchain uh, and as well uh, artificial intelligence uh, can be used in terms of, uh, you know, unlocking, you know, finance into the smart climate. And how, how we look at this is that uh, the, block, uh, the block, uh, blockchain really allows you know, um, this data to be stored in a way that uh, uh, is, is uh, not interfered with, that's encrypted. And also the artificial intelligence you know, allows some good analysis from the data, which helps in terms of making decisions in terms of uh, uh, helping you know, uh, either people access you know, finance uh, for their climate uh, energy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, actually, the last one. Next one. So uh, I would like to describe how this can be used, you know, using some visual uh, presentation. Uh, basically, if you do look there, um, the arrows suggest uh, in the left hand uh, movement of uh, money uh, from the corporates and individuals uh, to the generation and the distribution of renewable energy sources like uh, solar, wind, and geothermal. Uh, and also the allo also indicates the money getting back to the where it came from, from the corporate and the individuals. How do we do this, uh, particularly from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, or how can we be able to achieve this? What we are seeing as the most interesting um, you know, uh, business model uh, right now is uh, the pay-as-you-go models, you know, smart metering, uh, and this is all possible because uh, of the mobile money penetration within the Sub-Saharan Africa and also the increased usage of internet use. Uh, so basically uh, through uh, these uh, mobile you know, uh, penetration, we are able to collect data uh, both from uh, the generation and also from the distribution, which again can be used to be organized in a smart way and uh, that's where we can be able to use uh, a block, uh, blockchain uh, in terms of uh, bringing some transparency uh, between, you know, uh, in one end, the owners of the asset or the owners of the solar panels, and in the other end, in terms of who is financing this. So this allows us in terms of uh, uh, basically attracting funding, you know, like crowdfunding, uh, where basically uh, someone can be able to own assets in somewhere in Kenya, in somewhere in Rwanda, despite the fact he is somewhere in the Europe. And the only reason he can be able to do this is because we are able to collect uh, all this data uh, through uh, smart metering and also through you know, smart uh, contracts, which he can be able to see 
how the assets are really uh, performing. Uh, the other way is in terms also of our generation, uh, whereby uh, we can also be able to uh, kind of automate how, how we, we take the tokenization of our carbon reduction units. And this really also allows us to lower um, the future cost uh, of energy. And uh, again, uh, the, the last part of it is in terms of uh, how we can be able to use the contractual information like the smart contracts uh, in terms of, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, attracting you know, uh, crowdfunding like in the bonds and the equity. All this really helps in terms of uh, unlocking capital uh, through uh, smart digital ways, which in turn helps us in terms of uh, uh, pushing for the renewable energies like solar, wind, and uh, geothermal. As I did indicate, we are already seeing interesting uh, uh, business uh, innovations, uh, which has really uh, helped us attract more capital in the renewable energy sector. Just like in one of my colleagues mentioned, you know, uh, cooling as a service, uh, pay as you go, uh, among others. Thank you very much and look forward to get uh, uh, more contributions from these, also from the other panelists and also from the participants. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Manjo Wanjoy, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we'll now move to the question, uh, the first question session. So uh, please uh, ask questions if you have any, and they will be addressed to the relevant speakers. You can ask those in the chat, I believe. Um, Ms. Uh, Helene, could you please share the link, the link for the call for proposals that you spoke about? If you could share that, that would be helpful. Yes, I will share it in the, ch in the chat. Excellent. Thank you. And to Mr. Angelos, Mr. Mr. Angelos Munezero, can I ask you a question, please, uh, from the audience? Which finance mechanisms are you using to finance your smart waste collection initiatives? And are the operations private or public sector led? If you could uh, assist us with that. Thank you so much, uh, Adlan. Uh, hopefully you are able to hear me. So I want to respond to that question. Actually, as I mentioned under uh, the smart city agenda this is a flagship that rwanda is leading on the entire african continent so this is under uh, the smart africa alliance and we are leading this project together with them so the fund uh, for this project uh, was provided through a partnership that we have with smart africa alliance and we have someone to like sponsor the activity that is going uh, to happen so uh, we put out a tender and uh, we are aiming to get uh, a company that is going to work on that activity. So, of course, it's uh, it's both a public and private, uh, uh, if I would say, like project, because it's a company that will be working for us to make sure that we can uh, uh, start and uh, uh, launch uh, that project. I hope that I uh, clarify some of that question. Thank you. All right. Okay. Further. While we wait for Mr. Hugo, perhaps uh, Mr. Wanjoy, would you like to speak to the specific challenge, financing challenges that you experience using block blockchain? 
for example, the pay-as-you go, if you want to speak to that very quickly. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Mori, for your question. Uh, just to make sure I understand the question, uh, I can see you are interested in terms of uh, understanding the financing challenges that uh, blockchain can help um, in terms of uh, uh, giving solutions to the pay as you go. So, uh, good. So, so basically, as I said, is the transparency in terms of uh, information. And uh, how we do look at this is that um, how, how do we help in terms of P2P uh, connection, in terms of transaction. And when I mention P2P, I mention uh, from one end, the financiers, and also from the other end, uh, probably, uh, you know, um, where these assets or these solar panels are being used. Uh, so if we can be able to collect all these data uh, through uh, probably um, uh, mobile technology, uh, could be also through, you know, smart metering. And then uh, through the blockchain technology, uh, this data can be able to be prepared in a way that uh, the owners of the financials in one end, uh, they will be comfortable in terms of, um, you know, relying on what is happening on the ground. So they are able to monitor, you know, how these assets are being utilized. And by this asset, I think a good example, we are talking here about the solar panels. So uh, through the blockchain technology, uh, can bring in that transparency as I was trying to explain. And this can also allow crowdfunding in terms of um, people uh, who are somewhere in the developed world can be able to push their investment uh, through uh, these platforms, which are able uh, to reach onto the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and where they can be able to buy these assets uh, and uh, probably start using them in terms of the generation of a power from the renewable energy. I don't know whether uh, I've been able to answer your question more well. Yes, I think that's very helpful. That's very helpful. So without, without further ado, we can now uh, proceed to Mr. Hugo's uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Wanjoy. Uh, Mr. Hugo, please. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I'm expecting that the presentation should play out by itself. It's got, um, it's a recorded PowerPoint presentation. Let's see if that actually works. Oh, I need to speak to it as well. Okay. Welcome to my session on the value of providing data to consumers within Africa and what impacts this can have on our future. The data we are discussing is the data used by consumers on their mobile devices on the cellular networks. Mm -hmm. The reason why this is important is unless these consumers can readily access whatever is available from the internet, they won't consume it. So ultimately, unless you can solve the problem of making accessing what you're trying to offer available to the consumer at large, you're not going to be able to digitize what you're trying to do. An example of this is paying for transport. Rather than using physical cash to buy physical tickets, we can obviously see that you can use your mobile device to virtually buy tickets. But the problem is, how do the consumers out there afford the data to buy their bus tickets? And how can the bus company, instead of spending money on the kiosks to sell physical tickets, how can it spend that same amount of money on providing support for the digital economy? There is something out there called reverse billing, and it is a way for someone to sponsor data through to a consumer. There are challenges with this. Most of all, because telephony has typically been regulated around voice and not data, and telcos hold their data products very close to themselves. The call here is that regulations need to be adjusted to ensure that data products are as open and flexible as voice products are. The other point here is 
most of us would not want to deal with as many mobile companies as there are in a particular country. We'd rather deal with a single broker layer who then deals with complexity of the service providers. This complexity can be seen here. The real economy, the red arrows, is quite tightly held. The digital economy to enable data for consuming the real economy products is something of a roundabout where the consumer, the mobile company, and the data aggregator have to all cooperate to provide what the transport company needs. The opportunity is clear. By removing cash from the transport economy, we can enable government interventions, either through tax received or transport subsidies, where the government favours that. It also enables transport companies far better control of what's happening with their product. The cash economy tends to leak a bit between the driver operator and the transport company. And the idea is to drive better experience to the customers. The climate action opportunity means that as we improve the experience for consumers, they would choose to use this. Think about those of us with our own cars who've moved off to using Uber, and that's because it's digital. We would never consider using a cash taxi under the same circumstances. The other thing for the transport company, if it knew how many tickets in advance it was selling, it could better optimize how much transport to send out there to pick up the people. From a financial flow, it's more significant. The cash is difficult to manage and monitor. The digital purchase of tickets is proof of the validity of the sale of tickets and thus the viability and cash flows involved in a particular route. This means that financing any transport solution becomes much less guesswork and much more data based. But this is all premised, these benefits, on the fact that the customers can access the systems to sell on the digital economy. Without supported data, this is never sure and the digital economy will constrain. Right. That's my presentation over. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Thank you for doing that um, ahead of time, Mr. Hugh Bohan. Um, we can now move to our next speaker right away, Mr. Youssef Travaili, a Senior Fellow, Africa-Europe Alliance. Uh, please, Mr. Travaili, please proceed. Yeah, thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, indeed, I'm a senior fellow for the digital uh, team uh, with Friends of Europe, which is a leading European think tank headquartered in Brussels. Uh, basically, I'm one of the task force leaders within the Africa Europe Strategic Task Forces, where, uh, which include actually uh, digital energy, agriculture, transport, connectivity, and health. And I'm currently based in Kigali. So indeed, the question I want to answer today is really how can AI and blockchain technology be exploited in Sub-Saharan Africa to improve uh, opportunities for finance, for climate action in the era of digitalization? Uh, the, the short answer to that question is actually uh, fairly simple, is that we need to foster uh, bankable and economically, economically viable projects or flagship uh, projects to pilot, to demonstrate until they reach uh, the com commercialization stage. So basically, I'm linking this statement to uh, the second presentation by uh, Angelos from Ministry of ICT. And um, this, uh, this is pre precisely one of the ambition uh, that we are pursuing today uh, within the Africa-Europe Strategic Task Forces, which combine the, the above uh, thematic area, which I, I mentioned. Now, concretely, it's really, how do we foster such projects? And uh, clearly, uh, there is a low-hanging fruit. Uh, I will give you an example. 
which uh, uh, consists in supporting the deployment, for instance, of hybrid mini grids uh, as a key component in the future power grid architecture. As we move to centralized energy system, uh, which rely on burning fossil fuel, to a distributed peer-to-peer -peer system in which renewable energies are actually increasingly uh, consumed. So this is one of the examples I would put forward. And basically the technical challenge uh, we are facing when it comes down to this type of uh, energy system is really to maintain a stable and reliable electricity supply in the absence of large uh, electricity storage devices. So basically, uh, dispatchable versus non-dispatchable energy sources. And the, the, the solution to that, um, I see two solutions. Uh, the first one actually is to utilize, uh, to utilize sensors, which are connected to the internet of things to digitize the grid. And then to work with blockchain to track and share data, and then to implement artificial intelligence algorithm to optimize and automate the entire energy system. A second solution, which is quite interesting, but which is not immediately linked to the digital aspect, is really to replace uh, in those hybrid uh, mini grid system, to replace the conventional energy sources by synthetic fuels, uh, linking uh, thereby uh, energy system and smart mobility, uh, which is also a very interesting uh, approach uh, going forward. So in short, uh, the step one is to use sensors to collect data uh, to digitize the grid. And the starting point is really to create uh, what we call smart homes, and by extension, uh, a, a smarter grid in the, is the use of sensors which uh, measure energy usage, like smart meters, and offer two benefits. Firstly, the sensors allow data to be collected from appliances such as fridge, uh, oven, lights, and even uh, electrical vehicles uh, going forward. Secondly, um, renewable energy production from solar panel and wind turbine, uh, which are providing energy to the smart grid, can be monitored and combined with battery storage data to well balance supply and demand on the network. The second step, of course, is really to use the blockchain to track and secure the data. And one, once we collect the data from IoT sensors network, it needs to be authenticated, validated, and secure. And today, existing data infrastructures allows information to be stored in databases with only a single owner and lacks tool to facilitate the effective data sharing. And then the last step, of course, uh, which I mentioned about using artificial intelligence to optimize the entire system. So basically, in order to, both, to, to save both energy and money, uh, the security data collected must be analyzed for production and consumption optimization. So artificial intelligence company like DeepMind, for instance, recently used machine learning algorithm uh, to uh, train on weather forecast and historical turbine data to predict wind uh, power output 36 hours ahead of generation. So increasing the value of energy by around 20%. So in short, this is what I wanted to say on the role, on how you can use the combination of um, of um, IoT, uh, blockchain, and AI uh, to really foster a bankable project uh, for climate finance. Thank you. All right. Excellent, uh, Mr. Mr. Travail, Travail. Uh, we can now move on immediately to our next uh, speaker, who is Miss Molly Webb from Energy Unlocked. Uh, Miss Webb, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Hi, I'm Molly Webb from Energy Unlocked. Uh, Energy Unlocked started five years ago, but I've been working on the intersection of digital solutions for climate change through advocacy organizations, the climate group since 2007. Um, and the last five years has been a more deep dive into energy in particular, and the role of cities and startups, um, new technologies, new disruptive solutions in climate change mitigation. So today, I'm happy to, to um, 
sorry, pretty happy to move on to the next slide. Um, and the next one, please. So the whole purpose of these digital solutions is to get carbon free faster. And why we're focused on cities is because local authorities are of course close to citizens and under pressure to achieve net zero and they have limited funds that they need to spend in a way that decarbonizes fastest. Um, they also need to leverage the private sector in that out in those outcomes and cities are of course nationally material in terms of their huge share of final energy consumption. So they have a unique role to play. And our focus is given the trends of decentralization and digitalization, how do we apply those to decarbonization most effectively? Next slide, please. The most recent um, study that I wanted to highlight comes with from the Coalition for Urban Transitions, which Energy Unlocked co-leads with Overseas Development Institute. Uh, we we co-lead the energy work stream of this coalition, which is um, focused on influencing national urban policies to um, accelerate climate change. So the benefits of using digital solutions have been highlighted by previous speakers. And um, in particular, um, I wanted to highlight in this paper some of the energy um, considerations specifically, um, but energy solutions um, or financing energy transitions has co-benefits in terms of all the other um, solutions that were also discussed in you know, it, for instance, air quality, resiliency, um, and even linking to other built environment infrastructure optimization. So we see a lot of benefits. This paper um, with the link here on the slide um, is a, a framing paper to give you more background on the positioning of energy within the broader climate um, transition in cities. So next slide, please. Um, again, I just wanted to highlight that energy underpins the, the operations of the infrastructure. So we really are talking about markets and infrastructure and digital impacts on those. So we did a report um, with for, on behalf of DFID um, a few years ago, which, which was broader than energy. So I'm, I'm highlighting both of those reports so that if you wanted to have more background on some of the things that um, the speaker from Rwanda was, was talking about, for instance, there is more Exam there are more examples here relating not just to adaptation or sorry, mitigation and energy transitions, but to adaptation as well. What I wanted to highlight here, given all the work on energy and infrastructure, um, some of the financing implications um, that have been touched on by the speakers as well. So increasing accuracy of planning and predicting the um, outcome of those plans and being able to manage and operate according to those initial plans. Um, so that has big implications for financing. Also things like improving credit scores, improving credit worthiness has been touched upon. Um, cities in my experience often would prefer to start with something that benefits the um, service improvements, um, the service the ability to deliver a service. So increasing tariff collection um, for energy um, tariffs, for instance. Um, and of course, all of these digital solutions allow us to pay for performance or results, which has been mentioned as well. So I think those are the main um, benefits of having a digital underpinning to some of these infrastructure projects from a finance point of view. Next slide, please. Out of the energy specific work at the Coalition for Urban Transitions, I wanted to highlight some of our key considerations that we noted for national governments. And I will give a couple of examples um, to, of these so that um, we can get specific. But again, um, <laughs> a key finding is cities cannot deliver energy transitions without collaboration with national governments. Um, and this, even though there is um, a new opportunity for pay as you go solutions for the private sector to get involved for new players to start to um, disrupt the energy <laughs> incumbents, 
there is and there is still a role for that collaboration to ensure that there are optimal outcomes. Um, the, the value shift that national governments are going to see in away from centralized solutions toward more decentralized or digital solutions is very um, profound and will have a profound impact on how they regulate the energy system. Um, and again, I want to highlight a point that Yusuf Travalu just made, which is that the built environment in a city has not been recognized yet for its value in balancing the new system, whether that's microgrid scale or national scale, the built environment can be a sponge for renewable energy, can both generate and consume. And that is a new role, which requires a shift in how we think about regulation. So to give an example of that on the next slide, if you have solar on site, you could utilize that solar most effectively. You can export it to the grid. You can use it to power uh, or to heat water or um, use it in electric storage heaters. So there are ways that we could think about optimal utilization of assets in the built environment in ways that we currently don't incentivize. Um, the implications for this are that we need to think from a national perspective on how we encourage performance-based regulation so we can invest in the decentralized or the digital technologies, not just the centralized assets that traditionally are um, invested in, in order to get these lowest cost, least uh, uh, fastest decarbonization options. Finally, I'll, I'll show you one other example of digital solutions that on the next slide that support the collaboration that we were talking about. So we have found in our work, actually practically working in cities that, um, and this is an example from C40 in Durban, that having geospatial mapping, for instance, can facilitate common understanding of the problems, um, can, can enhance the baselining. Um, so what actually do we have already in the city um, so that we can move toward the a joined up understanding of what next different stakeholders can then assess their own role and they can assess their own risks and look for ways to overcome those jointly with other stakeholders. So that's um, a really important way to, to do both the, it could be citizen engagement, but also engagement between public and private sector and different levels of government from local to national. So I'll just um, leave you with a couple of thoughts. The, there are profound implications, as I said, for regulation for energy if we want cities to play this more active role in um, financing and operating their own um, energy assets or being that flexible balance to the, the national system. Um, but also because this new value chain of digital solutions and, and Hugo mentioned this sort of telecommunications infrastructure, Yusuf has mentioned sensors, smart meters have been mentioned. This whole new set of um, assets is a digital um, value chain and information value chain that supports the physical infrastructure. And we haven't yet considered the implications really for how we manage that to optimally deliver financing and climate outcomes. Um, so it's not a foregone conclusion um, that just having digital capabilities will necessarily get us to this outcome. So lots more work to be done. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hello, Luis. Hey, you said, you know, my email is not working anymore. Yes, uh, 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 
thank you very much, Molly. Um, Doctor Somoni, it seems your your sound um is is not clear at, at the moment. So I think perhaps we can move on to the next speaker, um, Ms. Dorothy Kisaka. She's the executive director of Kampala Capital City Authority, and we have a video from her. So we're going to play that now, and then afterwards hand back to you, um, Dr. Somoni. Hello everyone, and greetings from Kampala, the capital city of Uganda. My name is Dorothy Kisaka, and I'm the executive director of Kampala Capital City Authority. I am very happy to present at the fifth iteration of the Local Climate Solutions for Africa, hosted here in Kigali, Rwanda, on invitation by the regional director, Ms. Kobe Brand, and the local governments for sustainability. Thank you for the invitation, and I want to thank all the participants and presenters that have graced this meeting starting on the 3rd of November and going on up to 12th November. My presentation has four parts. There is this introduction, and then I'll slide into understanding digital innovations briefly. But the key question is the barriers and opportunities to ICT infrastructure and focusing on the Kampala's digital journey, and then we shall conclude. But let me first introduce you to Kampala, the location of Kampala City. Kampala is in Uganda, and Uganda is part of East Africa. And uh, we are located near the lake, beautiful Lake Victoria, but we are landlocked country. So with regard to the statistics, Kampala capital city hosts up to 4 million people during daytime. But at night, we have about 1.5 million who are residents in the city. It is a buzzing city with a lot of activity. About 60% of the country's GDP is generated in Kampala. We believe that by 2040, Kampala will be hosting up to 10 million people by day. We have a very strategic goal to be a vibrant, attractive, and a sustainable city. That's our vision, and all our strategic plans point to that. Let me give you uh, an idea of what our governance structure also looks like. KCCE is a body corporate and administers Kampala, the capital city, on behalf of central government. Our leadership has two parts. We have the elected political leaders. We have the, the ministers. Uh, we have two ministers for Kampala. And then we have the Lord Mayor and councillors. Those are all political leaders. On the other hand, we have the technical leadership, who are the heads of the directorates. We have 10 directorates directorates and several units. In terms of administration, Kampala is divided into very small units. First we start with the divisions, which are five, and then we have the parishes, which are almost a hundred. But the smallest unit is called the village, and there are 857 villages making up Kampala. In this presentation, we are asking the question, what are the barriers and opportunities to ICT infrastructure? Let me just reflect on the word, on the term digital innovation. Digital innovation is the use of digital solutions to solve urban challenges. In this case, climate change. And in Kampala, we have several of these barriers. Let me highlight a few of them. The first one is the high cost of infrastructure startup. To do anything with regard to ICT is very, very costly, involving the digging up of roads, the laying very expensive cables, and upsetting the already existing infrastructure, which is very expensive. But once you've set it up, there's the high maintenance cost to sustain technology, like software licenses and the purchase of new software, that is a barrier. 
Then thirdly, delayed adoption of technology by citizens. The whole uh, understanding of technology and people adopting, managing the change, that is a, 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 strength, a, a very strong barrier, especially when you see the age differences uh, across the city. The fourth one is limited technical skills to match the changing technology. Uh, people learned enough to to adopt to adapt to this new technology. Then number five, a lack of local content such as historical data in which to log this new information that is coming to us. And six, communication barriers in relation to language. Some some uh, technology comes to us in in English, in Chinese, in other language languages and there is a communication barrier which leads to social exclusion. Uh, going on, there's a lack of detailed physical planning which affects ICT installations through road cuttings and constructions, a lack of adequate regulations to protect ICT infrastructure, and then finally undefined client needs such as emergence response. We have opportunities for ICT infrastructure. The central government has provided the national backbone, and so we have Wi-Fi and able to communicate effectively. There is also the e-government portal for provision of electronic services to citizens and a national data center that promotes infrastructure sharing to reduce the cost of investment by individual agencies. The grants and donations that are given to local projects is also a great opportunity. And in addition, the strategic partners like Aston, Africa Smart Cities Network, and uh, WeGo, World Smart and Sustainable Cities Organization, is, a great, is of great benefit to the city. We also have primary data, such as the city addresses and house numbers, which are already there and provide us the e-commerce opportunity. Let me end with three opportunities. The new normal compels clients to easily adopt online services. So this new normal is a great opportunity for online payments. The promotion of shared services, for example, street lights also being used as communication infrastructure. And finally, the promotion of cost-effective local technology solutions to reduce the cost of imported software. The barriers and opportunities in Kampala are derived from Kampala's digital journey that started way back in 2012. Kampala, capital city, has accomplished several things. The infrastructure improvement, the fiber network, the automation of city payments, the street light master plan, the deployment of public Wi-Fi in partnership with the national network, and automation of trade licensing, deployment of client contact center, deployment of a pilot traffic control center, sanitation mobile app, Weyonje, online services, and so on and so forth. We are glad for these developments. One thing we must point out is that Kampala is also monitoring air quality at 25 sites for dust, smoke, dirt, pollution, and temperature. So as I conclude, let me, let me say this. Good implementation of ICT infrastructure in cities creates sustainable climate change improvement. However, city administrators need to overcome barriers to ICT infrastructure through citizen engagement and adopting modern technology policies while leveraging the available opportunities for ICT infrastructure. We are big on citizen engagement because we know we cannot do it alone. People need to come along in a language they understand at a pace they appreciate. I thank you all and wish you very fruitful outcomes from this engagement. Thank you.
excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Kisaka, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, we will now move on to our uh, second and final question and answer session. So uh, we will be taking questions from the audience. Um, I will. I will. I believe I, we already have one question. Okay. Um, one question to the well, the first three speakers um, relating to energy, transportation, and infrastructure. What are their thoughts? on using digital innovation to deal with the crisis such as COVID-19. Um, would anyone, I believe um, that the executive director of Kampala spoke to that, but would anyone of our speakers want to speak to, uh, in particular, energy, transportation, and infrastructure during the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so this would be on a volunteer basis. How have you managed this? Um, I, I could always try to say something. Okay, go for it. Sir. It's Hugo here. It's that the COVID crisis and the need to stay at home has shifted the meaning of what infrastructure is in a way that we possibly weren't looking at before. Before infrastructure for economic impetus was roads, rails, those sorts of items, quite physical items. And now we've had um, ICT infrastructure rising in importance relative to the others. So that's my statement. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hugo. Um, if no one wants to jump in there, uh, let me go to the other question about Kampala. Very interesting uh, lessons that other cities can learn from. How are you working with startups to deliver some of the innovative services and what finance mechanisms have you used apart from grants and your own revenue? Uh, so I believe this is directed to Ms. Dorothy Kisaka. If she is available. Um, I just want to mention that um, Ms. Dorothy Kisaka is not able to join, but she does have a representative on the call. Um, so if we please have Martin um, Sikaja to please respond to, to the question, if, if, he, if he got that, um, that question. So over to you, uh, Martin, if you could just share the, I mean, yeah, so just reflect on, yeah. on the question, which was that Kampala shared very interesting um, opportunities and initiatives that are currently ongoing. Um, how are you working with startups to deliver some of these innovative services and what finance mechanisms have you used apart from grants and your own revenue? Is Mr. Martin on? Yes, he, he is on, but um, perhaps he's having some difficulties with with his with his sound. So, um, yeah. So I'll, I'll hand back over to you then to take us to the next um, segment, which is. It has an explosion in the demand for energy, which led to zero plus crude. Hugo is right, data is a new crude. Any other questions? Uh, 
Okay, Mr. Martin is on. Please, Mr. Martin. Uh, go ahead, sir. Yes, I want to thank you all for the various presentations. Uh, I missed a few five seconds. I, I mean, about a minute. Uh, so, but I want to thank you all for the presentations. I think uh, the executive director, because of the time, uh, shared briefly um, about our uh, the, the question that was brought on board, and uh, we've seen invitations on attending other webinars. Uh, we'll, like to pick interest in those, uh, we'll be happy to attend those. I think we are taking home uh, uh, a number of, uh, uh, from, from very, various presentations, we are taking home a number of initiatives. I already contacted Mr. Sonia. I think he has not actually responded to me yet. Uh, we also have a smart city ambition, and I think it's a good platform to, 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 to share um, ideas because I know with the the various smart interventions that we want to take, uh, they contribute a lot to uh, to climate change uh, in terms of mobility, in terms of traffic con uh, reducing traffic congestion and the like. So I don't know if I missed any question that came from the other presenters. I thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, as we wrap up uh, for the final reflections, could I please ask all the speakers uh, to turn on their video cameras, please? All right, excellent. Uh, so I will just provide some general reflections. I thought all the presentations were excellent. Uh, I personally learned a lot. I think uh, one of the challenges about working in innovation studies is that you're always behind the technological frontier and so many activities are going on. Um, and so what we're trying to do is capture the innovative activities and try and systematize those. And uh, personally, I think um, I have learned a lot. I think one of the important things is that uh, financing, innovative financing for climate change has many spillover effects. Obviously, the climate challenge, but even uh, immediate air pollution uh, challenges and so on, th those are not necessarily directly related to the climate, but those come up. Governance challenges, access challenges, linguistic challenges. Uh, so these are multi-dimensional challenges. And so the kind of finance that can address all of those really has to be um, collaborative and, uh, and innovative. The, the, the last point that I took also is the importance of technological capabilities at many levels. One level is the competence to actually diffuse and implement these technologies. But as we move um, upscale, of, if you want, in terms of knowledge, uh, the platforms also require um, technological capabilities in order to do that. So on the user side, but also on the developer side, and there's a whole innovation value chain that can be captured to really uh, transform African countries, African cities and countries into knowledge-driven economies um, that are responsible, that are sustainable, that are inclusive. And this uh, in many ways is our uh, challenge at the present for the present and the future, but I am very optimistic based on everything I've heard, and I will be contacting some of you for further information. Uh, so it was an honor uh, for me to have uh, moderated this excellent panel, and I wish you all the best in endeavors. Uh, let's keep in touch, and all the best. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. And now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much. Um, thank, thank you very you. much, to our um, expert panelists. I think that was very, very interesting, very in interesting insights and knowledge um, and a lot of innovation that you shared. So I think the session and the content that was discussed certainly lived up to, to the title of the session. 
So um, on behalf of, of Italy Africa, the city of Kigali, as well as the government of Rwanda, I would like to thank all the participants as well as um, our panelists for all of their inputs. And just a last note on our side is just to mention that the, the Locks for Africa Congress continues um, until tomorrow. So as you can see on your screen, there's, um, there are a number of sessions that um, are still going to continue today as well as tomorrow. So we'd like to invite you to visit the, the LOCKS um, website and register and participate in, in the remaining sessions, um, starting with what, what, one is starting directly after this, uncovering the hidden flows in our cities. Um, and it's a photographic dialogue that will be showing um, in, and exhibiting um, photos from all over um, Africa. So that's very interesting for you to participate in. And then, um, and then there are two others. So there's going to be a capacity hub on urban nature, sharing lessons from, from Tanzania as well as um, a session um, today as well on the economic value of nature for climate. And then tomorrow, which is going to be the last day of the Congress, we have um, a session um, learning from young leaders. So we all know that youth is particularly important and they are the future of, of <clears throat> Africa, of the world. So I encourage you to just hear from all the young people about what are their thoughts um, in terms of um, solving um, the current global climate challenges. And then lastly, tomorrow at one o'clock, we will have the Locks for Africa 2020 closing ceremony and looking at the finance roadmaps for, for local climate action. So that will be a culmination of all the discussions that we've had in the previous um, week and a half. So with that said, um, I'd like to say thank you very much.